Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the most recent webinar in the Dataversity monthly series, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy with Dr. Wendy Lynch. The series is held the first Thursday of every month and today Wendy will discuss literacy is a two-way street, the case for both business and data literacy. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you would like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just a note, Zoom defaults a chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A panel. And to find the chat and the Q&A panels, you may click those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you the speaker for our series, Dr. Wendy Lynch. For over 35 years, Wendy has converted complex analytics into business value as a sense maker and analytic translator, a talented researcher and consultant to numerous Fortune 100 companies, startups, and healthcare giants. Her own work has focused on the application of big data solutions in health and human capital management. An author of books on effective communication and analytics, Wendy has pioneered the only structured system to empower a new generation of professionals who will revolutionize the successful application of data to solve business challenges. These, uh, so, and with that, let me give the floor to Wendy to get the presentation started. Wendy, hello and welcome. Thank you. And I am so happy to be here and always nice to hear your voice, Shannon, and happy to have many of you joining us again. So welcome back. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. This series is about data literacy, but in a, in a lot of ways, it's about the people who we have to focus on when we are thinking about data literacy. So today is about the two-way street that we might think of for both business and data literacy. I wanna start by just making a comment about how literacy efforts often look to me. When people start on that journey of data literacy, it often feels as though it is an investment in a one direction pathway. So what I mean by that is we sort of think that as we get better and we get better at people understanding how to ask for, let's say, a report, then further down the line, they start to really grasp what some of those insights are, and then they actually start to have a real understanding, but that's a ways away. And what I see people doing is thinking that there is a journey that they can be on that will get them to the glory days of the future where everybody understands data. And so maybe there is nirvana somewhere down the line. But when we think about this as a single direction, I think we minimize the real complexity that is data in a business setting. When you actually think about how the whole journey of any particular data source that goes through the various platforms and all of you that are involved in governance and architecture and management know that this is a fluid ongoing type of endeavor and it can't really be one direction because everything is getting updated at all times and everything is coming in getting revised tomorrow, reality is different than today. So if we are thinking about business outcomes and we're thinking about the data that help us achieve those business outcomes, we can't be thinking about as one direction. We have to be thinking about it from a multi-directional perspective. So I wanna remind us of how the business environment and the analytic environment are often structured when we're talking about an organization. Most places, the business environment is considered separate from rather than integrated with the analytic environment. They think of data as part of IT, 
rather than data being part of the fabric of the entire organization. And when the business is asking for information, they often just send a request down to what I would say the analytic in the separate analytic department, the analytic environment. And that department, that environment, those professionals create a design. They do an analysis of some kind or um, um, put things together, package it up and throw it back over the fence so that the business can use it. We do this, but many of the studies that have been conducted about how successful we are tell us that more often than not, we have to revise what it is that we threw over the fence because it wasn't exactly what they meant to ask for. And so here we are with these two different groups. And as we think about it, there is a gap in understanding. And it is partly language, which is what literacy deals with, but it's also bigger than that. So as we think about this whole endeavor of helping people, that first request that comes in from the business usually sends us off to do some type of fancy analytics. So we are working hard on it. We send it back end up having to do rework and reanalysis because we weren't exactly sure where that business really wanted to go. So if we think about that journey as being way more complex and both directions or multi-directional, then we start to think about this in a different way. So I would say it's much more than words and terminology and definitions. It's the context of those words. So I wanna give an example, and this is a, a, a real life example. Uh, business client says, oh, I need a dashboard. So those of us on the analytics side, we hear dashboard and we think, oh, we have to design something that has a platform on the back end that gives them a chance to look at things. So we all of a sudden start heading off into a direction. And if we say, oh, a dashboard, say more about what you need. They may say something like uh, a dashboard that shows comparative performance across locations. OK, so again, we start thinking, OK, this is going to have to have information about the locations, information about what's going on at those locations. And so we say, so the dashboard would be something on an ongoing basis that you can use to track things. And they might say, oh, well, I don't know that I really mean a dashboard. What I really mean is a report um, so that I can get an answer uh, right away. Oh, okay, so you're not really needing a full dashboard that you have forever. You just want a report that summarizes things. And they say, well, maybe it's, I don't really mean a report. I just need some information about something um, that I need to work on. Oh, so you need information. Okay. So what kind of information might you need? Well, I need to make a decision. Oh, so what kind of decisions are you needing to make? Well, I actually have to compare those locations because I need to make a decision about whether one of them isn't uh, cutting it. Oh, so what criteria might you use to decide um, which of those departments, which of those locations isn't doing well? Oh, well, I haven't really thought about the criteria, but really I need to have information about the profitability of each location because I need to make some budget cuts. So when we have those kinds of conversations, even though we're talking about helping people with literacy, literacy only takes us so far if we don't understand what is going on in the business. So they came to begin with as, oh, I need a dashboard. But really what they need is to figure out how to make a decision about their budget and whether 
to cut funds for one of the locations. So we see these kinds of interactions all the time. And the analytic people need to understand more about what they mean when they first come with a particular request. And the business people need to understand a little more about what's possible and what kinds of things can happen as the result of the data that they need in a format that they need. So they have to get some clarity. And so whether we're talking about dashboards or other things, think about the magnitude of this problem. Every day in corporations around the world, there are literally millions of requests where the two teams do not understand each other. And it has more to do with communication than it does necessarily with terminology. You all, I'm sure, have examples of this, whether it's somebody saying dashboard when they really just meant information or criteria, whether somebody, one person asked me for an ROI. And when you ask them what they meant by ROI and which things they wanted to compare and what was their um, investment so that we could get the return on that investment. And they say, oh, I don't mean an, an ROI. I just want to know whether we got better. Because that's what their terminology meant to them. It can be ROI just meant improvement. It could be I've had leaders say, well, we need to correlate these two things. Well, if I took them at their first request, I would run a whole bunch of Pearson correlation coefficients, but no, what they really meant was compare. It isn't necessarily that they don't know what they want. They just not, may not say it in exactly the right way. And on the other end, they may say we need to compare earnings. And if the Analytic folks don't really know whether they mean net earnings, net revenue, what they exactly mean. They may provide something different. And I have seen that happen before because they don't understand the context of the request from the business perspective. So as we think about these two directions, we have to remember that it is terminology. It is awareness, fluency, literacy but it is also how we interact with each other. So when we think about it from the big picture, what leaders want is timely, innovative insights from the data. And they want to know that those insights are delivering measurable value. That's what they want. Now, the data teams they really want meaningful, challenging work in an environment where they can actually achieve things that make sense, that the data are reliable, that they can do it with minimal hassle. And they want that work to be appreciated and valued. In order for both teams to have achieved these outcomes, we need a little more data awareness, which is why we talk about literacy from the business folks. But we also need more business awareness from the data folks. It isn't simply that we need these guys to articulate exactly what they want in a terminology that these guys understand. We also need data folks to understand what it is that is the priority for the business. So I often tell people that the problem is not that we have insufficient resources or that we don't have talented people or that we don't have good tools or systems. The problem is that we often see things from only our own perspective. And so today is about seeing things in both directions. Now, I spend most of my work on being an analytic translator and training analytic translators. 
And so what I thought I would do is share with you how an analytic translator looks at this challenge, at this lack of communication, this lack of comprehension on both sides. And the very first thing that an analytic translator does is to have some empathy. So that empathy <clears throat> comes from appreciating each other. We have to appreciate, first of all, that we have different languages, that it isn't on purpose, usually, that somebody is using jargon. I have been working with somebody on a completely separate project that has to do with finances, and she keeps on saying, do you have the EUI? Do you have the AM? Do you have the blah, blah, blah? And I do not know what in the world she's talking about. So we have to know that everybody operates with different languages. And it's not that we want every business leader to be able to define the equation for variability, um, but we do need to start to understand what's possible and what challenges each other has. We also have empathy because these are two different groups of people with two different types of personalities. If we look, for instance, at the Myers-Briggs and what is the most common, now I realize the, there are exceptions, but the most common personality in each of these groups, business leaders tend to be extroverted and make quick decisions based on details. Data scientists are introverted and like to consider possibilities and what the other options might be. So we already see that we have different language, we have different types of people. So those personalities don't always jive. And there's a good reason for these. So as an analytic translator, we understand that each of these groups has very, very specific needs in the work that they do. So if we think about Sheldon from Big Bang Theory being a typical data scientist, and we ask him, does your product improve employee performance? Well, he might say something like that our analysis controlled for demographics, 10 year previous performance, location and job type. We did a time series um, analysis, removing seasonality, transforming the outcome to a binomial, showing that participants had significantly higher likelihood of improvement at a p-value of 0.02. That would be a reasonable response if a data scientist is talking to another data scientist. If you ask Don Draper from Mad Men, does your product improve employee performance? He will likely say yes. So as we begin to understand both sides, it's not just the words we use, it's the way we like to present information. And we are trained so differently. This one always cracks me up as I was thinking about it originally, thinking about training. When you go through a um, MBA program, you are trained to see things in a way that you can easily take action. You look for differentiators, you look for opportunities, you look for how to be decisive, pivot quickly, and take actions to be successful. On the other side, data scientists are literally trained to formally, formally, I can't always say that, formally doubt ourselves. What I mean by that is you go through semesters and semesters of understanding all the reasons that you might be wrong. You actually quantify using things like p-values and confidence intervals, the likelihood that you are wrong. There are types of errors, types one, type two. There are subsets of errors. 
And you are trained to document the limitations, uncertainties, and potential bias in the way that you look at things. So that caution is the way we are trained to look at the world. Now think about how that sounds when you on the other side, the MBA training is telling you to move ahead, to use what you have and move forward quickly. On top of this, business leaders aren't trained in advanced statistics and usually not in communication skills. And data scientists are not trained in business management or communication skills. So we have this chasm. We have this big gap between the two. So it isn't just the language, it's how we use information. And lastly, we have different preferences about how we express ourselves. And I grew up with a <laughs> theoretical nuclear physicist for a dad. Now, when you listen to what's happening on the right, you think of my dad. Business leaders, they want to deliver results that are simple, clear, understandable, indisputable, and convincing. Data scientists or scientists in general want you to understand how complex the possibilities are because they love learning something new and presenting something different. They think everything is interesting and want to explore it, tell you how unique it is, and share just how advanced the techniques were. If you're on a data team like the teams that I collaborate with, they can't wait to use the newest and greatest methodologies. So what's interesting is that the person on the left, our business leader, wants it to be so clear that it needs no explanation. The data scientist wants it to be so interesting, everyone wants an explanation. So when they have a fancy, exciting result, they want the business to be really curious about how they got it done. The business leader wants them to just get to the point and quit droning on and on. Again, we can't simply say literacy is understanding the exact way that people describe a particular concept. It also has to be that we understand where each other is coming from. We are so different in all of these ways, our language, our personalities, our training, our expression, that it's almost comical that we are trying to work together. And if we don't appreciate what each other has to contribute and we don't have empathy and appreciation, we are going to struggle. So it's not just what we know about each other, it's also how we learn to talk to each other. And I always emphasize for people learning to be an analytic translator that yes, it's about language, but it's also about context. So let's describe some of the things that get in the way. I did a series of polls on LinkedIn. This one uh, was for data analysts and analytic teams. And I asked them, how often are you able to provide the exact answer that the business wants the first time with no rework? Well, you can see it's pretty discouraging. Only one person in 20, and this was actually 40 people, so two people out of 40, said I can provide that every single time. More than two thirds say less than half the time or almost never. What was interesting was that one of the respondents actually sent a note and said, I answered most of the time because technically I did give them exactly what they asked for, even though it wasn't exactly what they wanted. So he or she proved my point exactly. We do not 
figure out what the other person wants. So let's talk about what gets in the way um, when we don't have two-way understanding. And that first one there is expectations of mind reading. We often get requests like dashboard when we really need budget comparisons. Uh, we expect the, the person to know what we're talking about. Another thing that we have to recognize is that expertise requires us to have unique terminology. If you're a CFO, if you're a pilot, if you're an air traffic controller, if you are a marine biologist, an artist, a social media marketer, you have specific terminology that allows you to communicate about a particular issue. We need that. We want that. And when we find someone else in our profession who understands that insider language, we feel instantly connected. If you go to a party and you are an avid bird watcher and you meet someone else who's a bird watcher, you love to talk about what you just discovered. However, between two different professions, insider language divides us rather than uniting us. It actually alienates other people because they feel like an outsider. So when we think about the way that we translate, when we think about literacy, it has to be in both directions where we need to both understand the priorities of the other person and avoid assuming that other people know what we're talking about. So another problem is that insider jargon and that operates in both directions. So the next poll that I'll talk about was again to the analytic team. And I said, describe how your relationship is and, and how your requests come in. I mean, are they, uh, are they asking you for your input? Do they give you context for why they need it and what they're gonna use it for? And what you see is that fewer than one in 10 think that it's a really great relationship and that requests are um, collaborative. And over two thirds say it's either completely frustrating with no context or sort of okay. So what we see is that it's a frustration the requests that come in have very little context. They don't ask for the input, which means there isn't a respect for what that data person probably knows and the intelligence and wisdom that they bring is not being recognized. And so when we think about requests, so we're talking about this part of a project, that request that comes in at the beginning before the analytic people create a design, we have to think about how that happens. How is that request made? Because too often the request is cryptic, rushed, unidirectional, as we said, we're not asking them for their ideas. It's transactional rather than part of a bigger collaborative effort that recognizes everybody's contribution. And they come in and they're ultra urgent. They needed it yesterday, even though it's possible that it could take a considerable amount of time just to get the data together. So we have to understand how we are starting projects because these tend to be what I call drive-bys as they used to, in, if we were in person, they used to walk by, the, by your office and throw a request in the doorway before they move on. Um, what we are talking about here is often, it just comes in in a two sentence request. We also need to make sure that we're understanding how much goes into the work that the analytic teams do. 
And that also applies to the way that we update those requests. Another thing that happens a lot that I see is that changes come in without a whole lot of um, understanding of what it's taking for the other team. So business environments are constantly changing. Priorities change. Things come up. Emergencies happen. Things are going to change. That's not the issue. It's not that you can never change. But if they do change, how much do we update the other team? If the business is going to change what they need, do we acknowledge what it takes? Um, do we uh, let them know that we appreciate how much they had to do, even though they don't need it anymore? Do they appreciate what it took to get everything ready? Or does it come across as, oh, yeah, yeah, we forgot to tell you that you don't need that. So this, again, isn't the straightforward literacy about, oh, we need to have them understand the terminology. We're talking about how we communicate and how we work together so that there is ongoing trust between the teams. So uh, I call those fire drills. How often does a team ask for results and then not necessarily meet them? So the teams end up spending a lot of time and energy. Rather than it being a case where they get it wrong, they just uh, don't need it anymore. If we look at it from the other direction, I also asked um, business professionals who work with analytic teams and asked, how often do you get and understand the exact answers that you need? And it's almost a mirror image of what we hear from the analytic side. Fewer than one in 10 say they always get what they need and they totally understand it. And again, two thirds are saying, wow, I, I don't know what I'm getting. I sort of get what I need. I don't really necessarily understand it. Um, and so they are frustrated and feel like Nobody is giving them what they need in order to make the decisions that they need to make. Both sides are frustrated. Both sides are contributing to this lack of understanding. So when we think about this whole area and we start to think about this other side, so giving the business what they need in a way that they can understand, there are also a few pitfalls that I can describe on this side. Because there are times that the folks in the analytic environment take for granted that folks up here are gonna understand them, appreciate the way that they see the world, appreciate the effort that went into it. And sometimes they can um, be so absorbed by what they believe is the right way to do things um, that they don't think about the language of what they are delivering. So I'll give you a, a short story. When I first um, got into the working world out of academia, I was working for a startup and it was in the first year of the company's existence. And we had just done a six month study to look at the new product. So the question was, does this product um, really do what it's supposed to do? And the future of the company kind of depended on it. So I was working for the head of the analytic group and the head of the analytic group gathered everybody together and included the CEO, the head of sales, the head of marketing. So everybody was anxious to hear what the results were. And I don't know why, but the head of analytics decided that the best way to start the presentation was overall the program didn't have a significant impact. Now, technically, that was a true statement. And as you can imagine, everybody in the room was starting to think about 
dusting off their resume because, oh my God, we're not going to make it if we can't even have good results for this first trial. But the real answer was that the people who enrolled in this new product slash program really did improve, but enrollment was lower than they hoped it would be, which is a very different answer. Now, technically, if you included people who didn't enroll with the people who did enroll, which in academic situations and research design is technically the way that some people like to evaluate it, but in business, we need to know all of this. And so there was a lot of damage done with that relationship because of how that meeting started. Because this answer is we need to really improve our marketing and recruitment, but the program itself seems to be solved. So what we have to avoid when we are delivering information is avoid being disruptive, avoid sharing a lot of details that don't matter, avoid delivering messages that are confusing or more complicated than they need to be. We can spend the time digesting things in a way that meets the needs of the business. And so we need to avoid throwing what I call grenades. You don't throw a grenade into a meeting and then hope that everybody recovers when you get to the real detail. Similarly, you don't want to um, bury the treasure. If the good result uh, is what matters in the meeting, don't bury it after the 18th slide about methodologies and populations and limitations get to the point so that the business leaders understand and then describe it. Also, similar to insider language, we don't need to use terminology that doesn't matter to the business overhaul. They need to trust that we know what we're doing. They need to trust that we use the methodologies that are necessary. They need to trust that we can provide them with information that is credible. They don't need to know what the words heteroscedasticity or gradient boosting really mean. If they want to, sure, we can explain it, but they don't need that. And too often, I find that scientific types believe that if they use a lot of syllables, it will make them look smart. Instead, it actually makes them look kind of disconnected and unaware. So as we think about these aspects, people may not think that this is literacy, and technically, maybe it's not literacy. But if we don't have these kinds of ways of communicating that avoid those problems, then we're going to be in trouble. So some of the things that we learn for two-way literacy is identifying and prioritizing what matters to the other team, which means we have to understand it. We have to take the time at the beginning to clarify and understand rather than guessing and looping around again to rework and reanalyze. We need to build the skills to have the right questions to begin to uncover the context that matters to both parties. Some of the tools that we use as analytic translators um, are simple, open-ended invitations to say more about what they're thinking, to tell us how this came up or who might use it. And also understanding that there are specific questions for guiding a conversation in different directions to explore what we call levels of meaning whether it's in specifics or whether it's in motivation, we can uncover things that the 
requester hasn't even thought about yet that will guide how we are most helpful to them and helps them get clarity. So I wanna do a brief little exercise with all of you. What I want you to do right now is think of an important question that your organization needs to answer using data. It can be anything. Just a question that you know right now your organization wants to answer. Preferably one that hasn't been completely answered already, but I want you to just jot down what that important question is. Okay, so you have the important question in front of you. And now what I want you to do is listen to a series of questions as it pertains to that um, data need for your organization. And just think about how you might answer these. I, I'm not gonna have anybody raise their hand and do it, but think about how you would consider the answer to these questions as you think about your issue. So how did that question, that need for data originally come up? How will the answer specifically be useful to the organization? Who else might be interested in that answer? And for what might they use that? How will you know that we've answered that question satisfactorily or sufficiently? What's the important time frame for that specific data need? Is there anything about it that needs to be included or excluded that you haven't thought of or that I might not think of? Is there anything else that I might need to know first before I might do something to get the data? So now I want you to answer this. Did any of these new questions make you want to adjust how you worded the first question? Would you qualify it? Would you shift it a little? Would you think about it in a slightly different way or actually ask it completely differently? Because when I ask a similar series of questions, not exactly this, but when I ask a similar series of questions, when a data, I mean an analytic translator asks a series of questions like that, nine times out of 10, the original request has evolved. So when we think about these drive-by requests, the chances that we got it exactly right the first time are very small. And analytic translators learn in the first week that the first thing that somebody says is not the full answer and probably not what really matters. It's not because they don't know, it's because they haven't had a chance to think it through. Your job is to help them think it through. So as we think about it this way, literacy can't just be the words and the appropriate terminology. It has to be how we help somebody get clear. Because terminology is not enough. It's not just the words that we choose, what those words mean to them, to us what matters about the request, how we deliver what we discover, and what the context is, and how we might use that context to inform the way we answer the question. So when we think about what the data environment is behind a business. It really has to be thought of like this. It's not a straight line. It's never a straight line. And it's not the same straight line tomorrow 
as it was today or yesterday. So we have to be thinking about all of the ways that it's evolving and how to provide information that is appropriate, that is useful, that is timely, and also understandable to everyone. So it's not just what business leaders want, separate from what data teams want. It's connecting these two things for what we all want, which is to do our work in a way that it actually benefits the company as a whole and that we all feel like our knowledge and our abilities are being used in their best, most complete way. So if you're interested in analytic translation and you like to think about literacy in this bigger way, um, we do have a book, How to Be an Analytic Translator, and I also um, offer trainings as well as coaching using recorded videos that show just how difficult it is for these uh, <laughs> these uh, opinionated business leaders like Lee on the left and these very conscientious but a little bit misguided uh, data scientists like Anna on the right. And we use those examples to help people understand how things go wrong and how to improve. So I will stop there and I will rely on you, Shannon, to uh, help me go through some questions if there are some. Wendy, um, thank you so much for another great presentation. Really appreciate this. And just answer the most commonly asked questions. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording, uh, along with links to how to uh, continue the education with Wendy. So Diving in here, Wendy, my organization is starting on its data governance journey and data literacy is a key component. Any advice on how to start? Any practical tools, methods, suggestions? Um, well, I would say that when you start out in this area of um, analytic translation, when you, when you start out, becoming an analytic translator. A lot of this is some basic communication skills that um, we as professionals, and I don't mean just analysts or just business people, pretty much everybody um, has had insufficient <laughs> exposure to the ways that we can talk to each other in a more constructive way. So asking questions, taking time, having the intention to really support the other person and hear what they need um, rather than only focusing on our area. So I guess I would start there. Thank you. And Wendy, the dashboard to budget discussion is very important, of course. Isn't that isn't what you're describing here just fundamental analysis? It seems to me that uh, any report writer who does not conduct that type of inquiry analysis before building a report is just not doing their job. Your thoughts on that? Well, I would agree that it seems like it's very straightforward. Um, and we would hope that anybody who's going to do an analysis actually dives a little bit deeper into it. But I will continue to um, emphasize that often when somebody asks us for help on an issue, they haven't really thought it through yet either. And so if we don't, as a, um, as a partnership, really explore it, or if we don't also ask like who the other audiences are, or if we don't figure out exactly how it could be used, or what the context is um, surrounding all of these issues, we often miss the miss the point. So there are groups out there where they do this really, really well. And it may be that the um, person asking this question um, 
does it really, really well already, and it seems very straightforward. Um, so if that's the case, then great for you. Um, I just see over and over and over again that um, analytic teams are given very cryptic, urgent, um, out of the blue requests that um, are difficult to answer because they don't have the information they need. Perfect. So, Wendy, have we lost the essential skill of business requirements analysis? Um, that would presume that we had it at <laughs> we had it to begin with. Um, I would agree uh, that there isn't enough of that, and um, those people who do it well are very um, useful to the organization. So yes, I, I guess I would say we have um, either lost it or haven't uh, emphasized it enough in general. I was I was giggling with you through, through that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, what can a data analyst do to improve their business literacy? So one of the um simple things that you can do is you can make a request of uh, one of the business leaders or somebody uh, who you know on the business side who is um who you are acquainted with and interview them about their priorities right now so it's a great time of year to do that. Say, as we're looking forward, frame the frame the conversation with, as I'm looking forward to 2024, um, I want to make sure that I really understand what you guys are facing as the priorities for the business in the coming year or coming quarter. I wonder if you can describe to me the, the main things that are a priority to the business. And as they describe that, if there are things that you don't understand or that the terminology is a little different, you can say, wow, can you say more about that? What else do we need to know? How do you um, decide what those things are? So really explore with them with the intention of making sure that what you provide is going to support their needs. And I find that most people are willing to have those kinds of conversations when it comes from a standpoint of you trying to learn. So then continuing on that, so in the world of self-service analytics and citizen data scientists, translators should also be skilled in knowing how to keep their business counterparts from running with scissors. It's a <laughs> statement, but uh, I love that and wanted to get your take on that. Um, yes. I. There's only a certain amount of um, protection that we can provide. I mean, obviously there is, uh, we don't want um, folks who don't understand what it is that we have provided uh, to misuse it in a way that's harmful to the business. So, uh, so there is that. Um, and I think that trust is where is is the best defense against this. And what I mean by that is if a business person and an analytic person that you work with both understand that you have their um, success in mind, you have their priorities in mind, and you don't want to see them um, fail, but you also don't want to see them embarrassed. You don't want them to feel like they don't know what's happening. And so as you build trust, they are more likely to hear you when you say, you know, I am not comfortable using the results in that way and would worry about that. They're much more likely to listen to you than if you're the person who always says, Nope, you can't do that. Nope, you can't do that. Nope, you can't do that. Um, so there, there's a fine line between 
protecting themselves, protecting them from themselves and uh, simply just telling them they don't get it. And I think it comes out wrong sometimes. Indeed. So what is the difference between business analysis and data analysis translation? Um, when I talk about analytic translation, what I am talking about is a combination of the structure of how work gets done and the communication aspects of how to best um, define the work as well as um, deliver the work. So it isn't just the, um, from my understanding, it isn't just getting the terminology right and defining the variables right. It's about building a collaborative alliance between the two th two teams that is bigger than simply getting the question right. Perfect. Well, I'm going to give the community uh, just a minute here to uh, to submit any additional questions. Uh, I don't see any questions coming through. I love these. I, I just love these. Your take on this, Wendy. I mean, um, we we talk about this a lot, uh, trying to tr educate a few on how to communicate versus educating an entire uh, company on on many different things. Yeah. They may or may not be excited about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's what's interesting is is that this problem is pervasive. Um, I just released a report where I interviewed twenty um, executives in analytics, and overwhelmingly, they say that this lack of collaboration between teams is. Uh, interfering with the ability to be successful. Um, and the most common estimate was 50% less effective than they could be if in fact you had good collaboration and communication and understanding between the two teams. So it is huge. It's millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars and uh, excess angst and disappointment and feelings of un being unappreciated and turnover and analytic talent. I mean, it is, it is a gigantic problem that is being ignored for the most part because the analysts feel like the business people don't get it and the business people think that um, the analytic teams don't get it. And um, so we need to solve it. We do indeed. It's so important. And uh, so I agree with that. And Wendy, again, thank you so much. That is all the questions we have and, and really the, all the time that we have for today's webinar. Thank you so much. Lots of positive feedback in the in the chat there. Uh, and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. So thanks, sure. everybody. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. All right. Talk soon.